Hello and welcome to Baldy Cats, the boring science-based channel, sister channel of Conspiracy Cats. Now, have you ever wondered how mirages like this are formed? And have you ever wondered what the role of refraction was that allowed people to see the Chicago skyline from about 60 miles away? Well, stick around, we'll have a look at refraction, we'll have a look at how refraction uh, causes those mirages. It's going to be really, really boring. You might learn something you forgot at school, or you might turn off in about 20 seconds because you're fed up. Let's go. Right, so if we're going to understand mirages, we've got to have a really good grasp of refraction. This should take about two minutes and then we'll apply it to mirage. When we were at school, we all took a ray of light and we shone it into a glass block. What we might have done is taken a, a protractor and measured this angle here, which is the angle of incidence, the angle that the ray of light enters uh, compared to this imaginary line that's at 90 degrees to the surface of that rectangle. We call that imaginary line the normal line. This is really important because when the light enters the glass and slows down, it's entering something more dense and it slows down or more optically dense, it will move towards that normal line. When it leaves the glass, <clears throat> it will speed up and move away from the normal line, right? This is so important for mirages, yeah? When it, when it slows down, it moves towards normal. When it speeds up again, it moves away from the normal. Um, if I was to measure the speed of light in air, which is very, very similar to a vacuum, I'll give it the letter C. If I'm going to measure the speed of light in the glass, I'll give it the, um, the letter V. And if I take a ratio of that C over V for glass, I get about 1.5. That tells me that light travels one and a half times faster in a vacuum or in air than it does in glass. This is what we call the refractive index of glass. The bigger that number is, really, the slower um, light travels through that medium. So that's what refractive index means. And the bigger the refractive index, the bigger this effect of refraction. Right, but what would happen if, oh, just very quickly, the reason light does this is because when it refracts inwards, rather than carrying on in a straight line, and I know that doesn't look straight, I should use the ruler, we'll see that the distance, this distance here, from here to here, is shorter than this distance from here to here. And because light travels slower in this medium, it refracts effectively, so it's spending less time in the glass. Right? This is kind of touching on Feynman's um, sum of a paths explanation which is quite complicated but essentially it refracts so it spends less time in the glass so it can get to its destination quicker so saying that light always travels in straight lines isn't necessarily true it will always take the quickest possible path and that's what it's doing here it's spending less time in the denser medium now let's just forget that for a second let's say i've got a bulb a magical bulb inside the glass and it shoots a ray of light this way this is now my normal line this is my angle of incidence. We know when it moves into the less dense medium, it's going to refract outwards, uh, sorry, away from the normal line. But what if I take this bulb and I slowly start moving it this way? As I move the bulb this way, this ray of light that's leaving the glass is also gonna move closer and closer to the surface here until you see the picture I'm about to show you. Now, what we've got there is the ray of light hitting the glass at such an angle that the light is now traveling along the surface of this new medium. When we get the angle that causes that to happen, we call it the critical angle. So this angle here, right from here to here is the critical angle and that causes that to move across here. Why is the critical angle important? Well, if I keep going past the critical angle, really important for Mirage is this, if I keep going, then suddenly the light doesn't leave the glass at all and it reflects like this picture. It reflects inside the medium that it's in and it will not leave that glass block. We call that total internal reflection. Those are all really, really massively important for, um, for mirages. Just finally, I'm gonna to talk to you about Snell's law for about 10 seconds because I keep hearing people talk about Snell's law. Essentially, I said to you before that the, the bigger the refractive index of the glass or whatever medium it's going into, the bigger the effect of refraction will be. Well, if I call this, let's say I call that angle one and I call this here angle two, then Snell's law tells me that if I take the sine of angle one and I divide it by the sine of angle two, then that gives me the same number as a ratio that gives me the same 
as the refractive index of the glass or the refractive index of medium two divided by the refractive index of medium one. All we've got to take from this is that we can predict, right? If I know the refractive index, we can uh, predict exactly how much the, uh, the the wave will refract. Right? So that's what people are talking about when they, when they use Snell's law. Right, let's look at mirages. So I've got warm air here. Uh, I haven't, I've got a warm ground here, which means that this layer of air is warm. This layer is a bit cooler, and this is the coolest. If we look at density, this is the least dense. This has got the lowest refractive index. Light travels fastest here. This is the most dense. Yeah, the ground warms the air and the warmer rises. This is the most dense. It's got the highest refractive index. Now, if I've got a ray of light striking, let's say I've got a tower over here, a ray of light that's reflecting off this tower, as it starts to travel this way, what's happening? Well, as it goes from the more dense to the less dense, it's like the light coming, coming out of the glass block and it's gonna move away from that normal line. This is our imaginary normal line between those layers of, of air. So it's gonna move this way and then the same again. So the light is gonna take a curved path. Now, what we have to realize about the air is it's not just three layers like that. It's actually a gradient that changes all the time. And the best way that I can show it is by having lots and lots of little layers like this. So remember, we've got the most dense at the top, the least dense at the bottom. And every time it goes from one layer to the next, it's gonna be moving away from that normal line. And it's gonna to appear to be curving until eventually when it gets to about here, it's gonna be striking this layer at above the critical angle. And remember, when we're above the critical angle, we reflect, we don't pass through the, the layer. So we get total internal reflection here, but now when it's coming backwards, it's warmer down here, uh, so it's less dense here, it's more dense here, which means it's gonna to bend towards the normal line. And we get this curve this way. So if I'm stood over here, looking in this direction, on the floor, or what appears to be on the floor to me, I'm gonna be seeing the top of this tower, all right? In fact, virtually, the image to me would look like it's somewhere down here, it look almost like it's in the floor. So that gives me the type of mirage you see in this picture here. But what we've got to be really careful about is, is the light isn't reflecting off the ground, which I keep hearing some people talk about. It doesn't reflect off the ground, it reflects this way. So how do we apply this to the Chicago skyline? Um, that's obviously a different type of mirage, seeing something that's too far away. Well, the Chicago skyline is uh, caused when atmospheric conditions give us something unique, and that is where the air is actually cooler on the ground and warmer slightly higher up. When it's warmer slightly higher up, um, so here's, let's say this is my Chicago, that's the Chicago skyline there, perfect drawing. When the light reflects off the Chicago skyline and starts traveling in this direction, it's traveling into an increasingly less dense medium. And remember what happens when we travel into a less dense medium, we refract away from the normal line. And I'm gonna get that continually refracting away from the normal line until eventually it's striking the air here at above the critical angle. It can't now travel through there and it starts to reflect back. But when it comes back, it's traveling into the more dense medium, which refracts it towards the normal line. And that causes the light to continue to bend, just like the picture that you'll see now. <laughs> now, I've not drawn this brilliantly because I'm going to run off the paper. This should be more of a smooth sort of curve that goes this way. But essentially, if I'm stood down here, right, the light entering my eyes comes from here. And let's just imagine there was a huge curve of the earth in the way. Then this is how I can see something that I shouldn't be able to see, a mirage of the Chicago skyline that really should be blocked out by the curvature of the earth. Told you that was going to be boring. See you later.